Welcome to the Lawrence County Parent Academy this evening. I'm really happy you're here. My name is Tom McSheehy, and we're going to be talking about a very important topic, highly sensitive youth. And maybe your child is highly sensitive, or they know a friend who is, or maybe you are as a parent. So this information will be relevant for everyone this evening. I'm going to show my PowerPoint so we can share a visual screen. So we're just getting it lined up here. Here we go. So highly sensitive youth, how to support them and educate others. Just a little bit about myself. My journey is I taught 21 years as an elementary and middle school teacher. And I also have been for 26 years a social worker and family therapist. There are six ways to calm the brain and and balance the nervous system. Oh, there are many, many more ways to do it, both with quiet activities, but also sometimes movement can help calm the body and brain. But for right now, let's just take a moment, and this is gonna be really important to work with your highly sensitive child or a teenager to learn ways to calm their brain and nervous system. So let's try one right now. And this is a heart meditation, it's called. It's gonna be very quick. We'll probably just do it for 30 seconds. But the heart has 40,000 neurons. A neuron is, is part of what we used to think. And we have obviously a large concentration of neurons in the brain, about 80 billion roughly in that area. But by focusing on the heart, you can actually actually calm the emotional part and the survival part of the brain called the limbic system and brainstem. So this is how it works. You're going to place one hand on your heart and the other hand on your belly, and you're going to focus your attention on your heart. And you're going to think of a person, place or pet that you love. And then you're gonna breathe deeply, do some good belly breaths and focus on that person, place or pet. So again, you're gonna place one hand on your heart and one on your belly. You're gonna focus your attention underneath your hand over your heart. And then you're gonna think of a person or a place or a pet that you love and breathe deeply and focus on that person, place, or pet. We're just gonna do this for about 30 seconds. I'm gonna put a little quiet music on. So just allow yourself to try to just relax in this moment. So highly sensitive youth, this has been a really difficult two years for children and teenagers around the world, being confined and having to be separated from what we love in terms of people and activities is very difficult for children and their, their brains and nervous systems. And there, it has been traumatic for some youth. And traumatic means just that their nervous system gets overwhelmed with emotions and physical sensations to the point where it's hard to stay regulated, meaning balanced and in connection with other people that because we're overwhelmed, we have to go away or, and shut down or get really hyperactive. So don't be surprised if some of if your children are experiencing more anxiety as the pandemic lessens, they're gonna experience, we, when we go through something that's scary, we kind of, 
brace ourselves and tighten our bodies and just get through it. And then after it's over, our body starts feeling again, sensations and emotions. And it can be a lot for a young person for their brain to deal with. So if they feel more anxious and sad and other things coming up, it, it might be that they're actually healing in some way or trying to express all that pent up energy. And it's important if able to try to find a mental health practitioner or therapist to support you if your child's going through a difficult time. There are things you can do at home and we'll be talking about some. I just want to acknowledge that in the world, it seems that more and more people are becoming more and more lonely. And this is affecting teenagers, adults too, and I imagine children on some level. But in 2012, there was 18% of the United States teenagers were expressed that they were lonely. Now in 2018, it's 37%. And I can only imagine what it's now because of the pandemic. So over the years, we've been seeing more and more youth who are disconnected and feeling alone. And that's not good for mental health, but it's also not good for our society in general. You know, kids are meant to learn how to feel and how to calm themselves. And they learn that in connection with adults. It's the relationships of adults helping kids to calm and to learn how to label their emotions and feel their emotions and calm themselves is what builds the brain to help children later in life as they grow up to deal with strong emotions and calm themselves. And highly sensitive children and teenagers feel even more deeply. And it's not easy because often they feel so deeply in the world, they often feel very alone and like their parents don't understand them or other students or friends or, or teachers or coaches because they see and feel the world differently than a lot of the other children. This is myself as probably a five-year-old, maybe in kindergarten. And I was and I am a highly sensitive person. And I didn't know it till I was in my late 30s and learned about what it means to be highly sensitive. And it really helped me to, to gain information about it. And that's what I hope to share with you because there's a lot of shame that highly sensitive individuals feel often. So 15 to 20% of mammals are highly sensitive. That's all mammals and mammals are warm blooded animals. And that includes human beings. So one out of every five young people, youth are highly sensitive but 80% are not. So often highly sensitive youth feel like there is something wrong with them because 80% of the other youth feel and experience the world differently. And adults often wanna change highly sensitive children and teenagers like because they see them feeling deeply and feeling deep sadness or deep uh, fear and they wanna take that away, but that's not the route you wanna take with them. The goal is to support your highly sensitive children in learning to honor who they are and what they need and, and see the value and strength in being highly sensitive. It is a form of intelligence. It is a form of, it's a, it's a strength. And as I've aged and gotten older, I've come to see that one of my greatest attributes is my ability to be highly sensitive because it helps me connect deeply with other people, both as a teacher and as a therapist. And that goes for a lot of jobs. And there are some youth who have this great form of intelligence. I mean, every child has some form of intelligence, but some have this of being sensitive. This is a woman, her name is Elaine, I want to say Aaron, but she kind of brought forth this topic of being highly sensitive, I think back in the 90s, 1990s. She says, one thing all humans were born to do by nature is simply to be aware, fully aware. In that sense, highly sensitive children are superb human beings. What is the gift that your highly sensitive child has to offer to you? In other words, what is she or he trying to teach you? Because it's not easy to parent a highly sensitive child or teenager. 
because they feel and experience things so deeply, they can get overwhelmed easily. And that can, and they don't know how to manage because their brain isn't developed fully. They don't know how to calm themselves and deal with that strong emotion. And that's where parents come in to help them find ways to calm themselves, to help them understand who they are and not be feeling shamed about it, but to, to celebrate it and find tools to cope when they're overwhelmed in the world. And so somewhere, I always believe that children have something to teach their parents. And, and it can be challenging. The area that they challenge you in as a parent might be the area that they're trying to help you grow as a parent. So just be aware that the frustration or challenges of raising a highly sensitive child also might have gifts in it for you. They're very good at detecting anything out of, out of the ordinary in, um, with people. You know, they're very attuned to, to the environment and people around them. Here's a young girl and, you know, if you were gonna connect with her as an adult or as a parent, you can see from her eyes that she's feeling something. And to me, I sense that it's sadness. Um, and for highly sensitive kids, again, they're gonna feel deeply. They're gonna feel happiness deeply and they're gonna feel sadness deeply and they're gonna feel fear deeply and they're gonna feel anger deeply and or um, love deeply and they're gonna feel anger deeply and hurt deeply. So all the emotions get amplified and all their physical sensations get amplified. And that's a lot for a young child or young teenager to, to imagine, um, to manage without adults modeling it or connecting with them or helping them learn tools. What does sensitive mean according to the dictionary? It's quick to detect or respond to slight changes, signals or influences of a person or a person's behavior, having or displaying a quick and delicate appreciation of others' feelings, so empathy. And the origin comes from Latin, which the word resilient uh, or leaping back. So it looks very much like the word resilient, the English word, which we always think of the ability to leap back or bounce back. And the, you know, I'm glad they connect sensitivity with resilience because Highly sensitive people are very resilient, even though they have a, a stereotype that they're weak, but that's the farthest from the truth. Highly sensitive individuals are those born with a tendency to notice more in their environment and deeply reflect on everything before acting, as compared to those who notice less and act quickly and impulsively. That's one of the gifts is they're very thoughtful, and make thoughtful decisions. And that can be a good thing. Sometimes the action taking, making decisive decisions is, but sometimes it's important to reflect and take time before acting, you know, especially acting impulsively. It's interesting that in wild horses, a wild horse pack, the leader of that horse pack is the most sensitive horse. And the reason for that is because obviously they can detect danger well, and they're going to really be able to look for predators and keep that wild pack safe. So sensitivity, it, lead, highly sensitive people can make great leaders. Unfortunately, with human beings, we often still stigmatize highly sensitive individuals because they feel deeply as if they're weak, but that's not true. They just feel deeply and, in, and they're very strong internally. What are the characteristics of being highly sensitive? You know, this is a good picture to sum it up in one in sense. They're, they're very sensory. Highly sensitive individuals are sensitive in that they feel their senses, their eyesight, their taste, their hearing, their touch. Everything is, is amplified and they, they're more in touch with it, which has gifts to it, but also has challenges. Is your, highly, is your child highly sensitive? Do they startle? Highly sensitive children, they, he or she will startle easily. Complains about scratchy clothing, seams in socks or labels against his or her skin. Is very sensitive to pain. Is bothered by noisy places. Prefers quiet play. Seems to read my mind or your mind as a parent. 
they kind of know what you're thinking, feels very deeply. Whoops. It's hard to get to sleep after an exci exciting day when their nervous system gets revved up. Doesn't do well with big changes. Prefers a few select friends. Worries about a wide range of things, even more than kids, you know, the majority of kids, highly sensitive, worry, worry even more. They may be physically awkward or tense. Doesn't have to apply to everyone. For me, I wasn't physically awkward or tense. I, I have a tense body, but I'm, I play sports very well. So these are just, you'll see that many apply to your child, but maybe not all. Complains of stomach aches or headaches during times of stress. That's very common among highly sensitive. Notice subtleties, something that's been moved, a change in a person's apparent, that they tend to, tends to play it safe because again, they're so attuned to all the different emotions connected to decisions, they worry about making the wrong one because they might get hurt. It, is often surprisingly insightful and wise. They're very insightful and wise, what might be called intuitive. Seems to lack confidence, they do. They're often very hard on themselves and they don't always see their strengths or intelligence or gifts. Dislike staying away from home. They like safety, they like connection at home. Is affected by other children's distress or, or distress in the world for that matter, like the news. What do you fear is about your highly sensitive child? And I'll let you pause for a second. I'm gonna take a drink of water and then I'm gonna take a deep breath because when I, when I present or talk, I kind of, I get anxious and I find that my stomach gets tight. So I need to take a breath. I need to take a sip of water. And I invite you just for a minute, just to take a deep breath yourself, because again, these moments of calming yourself are gonna be something that are gonna help you with your child who is highly sensitive and to model that to them. So. So what do you fear is about your highly sensitive child? Maybe it's in that strong enough. Maybe it's hard to see them feel sad or feel like the weight of the world is on their shoulders, but it's really important for you to understand what's your fear and what's your child's fear, because when they start getting mixed up, it's gonna be hard to be a parent and parent in a grounded, um, regulated way where you're not getting overwhelmed with your child's emotions and sensations. Here is myself as a young, young baby. Um, obviously sports is really important to my family. And I love sports growing up. It was an outlet. It was a way to get energy of anxiety out from being a highly sensitive kid sitting in school all day. My family, my dad played sports and I was the youngest of seven. So I started growing up playing three sports and uh, one of them was quarterback in football. My dad had played football at Purdue University on a scholarship and, and he taught me a lot. Um, it was also a difficult relationship because sometimes it could be push me very hard. The one thing I want to say to you, because my dad, and I guess I'll go back to my dad for a second, just so you can, whoops. So my dad, I think, was worried a lot. He had been taught from his father to be tough in terms of tough, meaning don't feel any emotions or express them. But what we've learned from brain science in recent years is that feeling emotions and expressing them is actually healthy. It makes you stronger physically and mentally. And it's a good thing to do. It doesn't weaken you. It's not a sign of weakness, but that's what men were taught in my dad's day. And that's what he passed along to me was a shame and feeling, which made it hard as I pushed down all these feelings. And then they came back later in my adult life that I pushed down during childhood. So. My dad, again, I think was worried. I think he himself didn't feel comfortable with his own sensitivity, his own feeling. And when he saw his young boy crying or feeling scared, I think it scared him because he didn't know what to do. He didn't know how to support me. And so he went back to what he learned was to shake it off. Don't you know, knock it off. You got to toughen up. And he was always trying to change who I was. 
instead of trying to find out who I was and what my strengths were and fostering that. Again, he did the best he could with the information he had. And in some ways he did a great job. And that's the truth about all parents. Even the way that whatever was challenging to be with my dad, I have learned how to make it, turn it into a gift. But, you know, you don't have to toughen up, toughen them up, meaning highly sensitive children or teenagers. They feel deeply and they already deal with a lot and get through the world, even if they cry or if they express strong emotions or have meltdowns. It doesn't mean they're weak. It just means they have to learn how to manage all that energy inside them and calm themselves. It's a skill. They have to build skills and wire these skills into their brain as habits. HSPs, or I just said highly sensitive person, could be highly sensitive youth, are very strong. Imagine, I say with backpacks filled with intense sensations and emotions, imagine being a highly sensitive child or person because your emotions and sensations, physical sensations, you could multiply them times 10 or 20 of what the sort of middle range child feels. So they're feeling everything more intensely, but they still show up in life often. They need encouragement a lot, but it doesn't mean they're weak. It's the opposite. They're, they're actually feeling so much, it's remarkable they can show up and still be present in classrooms or on teams or whatever else. And so don't, don't um, confuse feeling deeply with weakness. That's an outdated belief. It's the opposite. They're carrying backpacks even more heavy than most students, and they're still walking forward. What are the gifts of a highly sensitive child? And it's so important to look not only when, because often their weakness is that they need help managing their emotions is so clear that the weakness, the gifts are lost sometimes, but they're very empathetic children and teenagers. They're smart. I mean, that's true for all students, so that's sort of redundant, but they're intuitive, they're creative, they're careful, which is, can be a good quality. They're conscientious to a fault. They're very reflective. They, they, they think a lot. They're caring, they're loving, and they're strong. I wanna share a little bit about the brain because when you can see how the brain functions and nervous system function, it's gonna help you see your highly sensitive child from a biological point of view, how their brain and nervous system is working so hard to keep them safe in this world. And because they feel so deeply, they're in touch with the danger part of life so much because of their brain being very sensitive and their nervous system that it can be confusing. It can be seen as a, as a character trait, that or character weakness, but it is. And again, it's just a, a biological thing, what's happening with the brain and nervous system. And the game is they can learn about who they are and learn skills to calm themselves in the brain. We know a ton about the brain. We've been learning a lot over the last 20 years. Slowly but surely, it's making it into schools, not fast enough, for, in my opinion, and then in the homes. But it's so important to teach your child about their brain, to learn simple things and teach them. Because it takes the shame out of what they're feeling. Because often teenagers and young people feel like something's wrong with them when they're feeling strong emotions. But it's not the case. They just need to learn skills. Here's a young baby having their brain mapped, the technology can show us what's happening inside young people's brains. And we get brain scans and other technology that's showing us and illuminating what's happening in the brain. It's a really fascinating time. And again, integrating this, these, this knowledge into homes and schools and on the sports teams is really important. This is the right side of your brain, which is called the right hemisphere. And so you're seeing a side of the side of it. You're not seeing the left side of the brain, just the right side. So we actually have two sides and I can show you in this little window here. It looks like this and you're just seeing the side view right here. So this is the side view. And the arrows are pointing to the cortex where we think, where we do reading and writing and play sports and music. But when we're stressed, we sometimes, a lot of energy can, can 
get pulled down to the lower part of the brain. And that's when we see students like this, when they're trying to study or learn or take a test or they're feeling some type of challenge, like a test or standing up in front of class or you know, standing on a playing sports and being in the limelight. But sometimes with stress, we can drop to the lower parts of our brain and we can't think down there. And this is what happens. This is kind of how, what I felt like as a kid, a young kid with learning disabilities and a lot of strong emotions and being sensitive. Sometimes I got overwhelmed and couldn't take my tests or I was really slow. And I often thought I wasn't smart, which wasn't the case. So when kids are stressed or adults are stressed, we drop down to two areas in the brain called the brainstem or the reptilian part of the brain. Reptiles have this part of the brain or the limbic system right above it, the mammalian brain. And this is their jobs. The rep brainstem is our survival center and it's nonverbal, it's just physical sensations and it keeps us safe, keeps our heart pumping, our lungs pumping. It's our area for calming our nervous system through the vagus nerve. And then there's the limbic system, our emotional center, that area that produces emotions and produce, helps us feel pain or pleasure. Um, it's the area that we have to be connected to for addictions because it has to do with pain and pleasure. So these two areas are nonverbal. You can't, you communicate through emotions and physical sensations. And they can hijack the thinking part of our brain or the brain up there in the cortex. And so when that happens, kids are gonna be sort of like the brain is offline, like a computer. You gotta get it back online and get them back up to the frontal cortex and the cortex. And this is the prefrontal cortex is right behind your front eyes. It's where we think and reflect and analyze about our strong emotions and physical sensations and decide what to do, what's the best route. And we develop that type of thinking through practice with our parents and teachers and coaches. So when we're stressed, we're gonna drop downstairs and we'll just call it the downstairs part of the brain where we're feeling, right? We need to feel in life to be motivated, to be connected to people, but we don't want too much feeling. We want a lot of energy to be in the cortex along with the downstairs brain. We want a lot upstairs. And that involves practice getting up there, and, and especially for highly sensitive youth. So when we're in stress and we have to perform, we got to get up to this part of the brain, gymnastics or anything else, mathematics. And as we know from uh, Simone Biles this summer in the Olympics, she's a gifted gymnast, but because of stress or trauma or whatever else she was dealing with, she was in the downstairs part of her brain and couldn't really get up to her cortex the upstairs to perform. And these gold medals came from the previous Olympics. So she had a tough Olympics, but she was so courageous in speaking out and chose not to perform in most events because she just couldn't feel like she was in her cortex and felt confident performing. It was great that she could open up because it makes the more celebrities open up, especially sports celebrities and military personnel, it creates this feeling that it's okay to be human and to be challenged and there's nothing wrong with you, which youth need to hear. So again, when, when we're down in this area, too much of our energy, we're gonna have trouble performing at our peak. I wanna talk briefly about the nervous system because this is in play is so important with all children. I mean, all human beings really, but especially with highly sensitive. So here's our nervous system, how our brain communicates with our body and how our body communicates with our brain is through the, all the nerves in our body. Like it's like a super highway um, and of wires. It's like this amazing you know, wiring throughout the body that sends information up to the brain and the brain sends information down to the body. And this is where, when, when we're going, just imagine if you have all this wiring in our body, in most houses, there's 120 volts running through the wires of the house. But sometimes if you put an electric stove in or an air conditioning system, you have to get an electrician to rewire your, your box and make it able to deal with 220 volts running through the wires of a house. If you don't rewire and you run something that's too strong for the, the house to handle, it shuts down the 
electricity. That's the same for a highly sensitive youth. They, they have the wiring that's made for 120 volts, but they have 220 volts of emotions and sensations running through the body. And they often have, um, they shut down. It's like uh, they blow a fuse in some way in the old electrical systems of house. And they, you know, so you have to go back and retrip it. That's just an analogy for what happens and how young people, highly sensitives can shut down. We have two sides to our nervous system. We have one that speeds us up like a jackrabbit and one that slows us down. We need that jackrabbit to get things done in life, but we need to slow down and breathe and digest and rest so we balance the nervous system. Otherwise, we burn out in life. It's a lot like a, the gas is a sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic is our break, our slowing down. And there are actually two sides of the parasympathetic um, the sub branches, but we won't go into that today. Just this idea I want you to know of speeding up and slowing down. When stressed or you don't feel safe, what do you do? Because our, your nervous system and brain are, are there to protect you and keep you safe in the world. And they often become unconscious. We're taught as, as young people to not feel and we push it down and we lose touch with our body. But the limbic system or our emotional center Helps, usually helps us take action to feel if you're not feeling safe, either to stand up for ourselves and, 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 and speak what, say what we need or to go away from someone if they're bullying us or we're scared. So we take action of, of stepping up or moving away. And it also we can speed up just to do something like thinking or dancing or moving somehow. But if we don't feel safe, some people, highly sensitive, sometimes get hyperactive or anxious and they just can't sit still. That's speeding up when they don't feel safe. And if that doesn't work to get rid of the feeling of fear or feeling threatened, then they go down to their brainstem and they just shut down, which looks differently. Ideally, when we have high stress, where do you go? We ideally want to stay connected to other people because it helps us stay regulated and ground us so we can stay in our frontal cortex and thinking. If we get overwhelmed with emotions and sensations, we drop down to the limbic system, we start moving to try to feel safe. If, does that, if that doesn't resolve the threat or feeling unsafe, and this could be a test you're taking. If you're anxious, you're gonna start maybe tapping your foot because you're scared and trying to move that energy. If that doesn't work, then you just, and of course movement can look like this, which is healthy movement, but it also can be really where kids are just so scared, they're just pacing around the house. And that's movement that's you know too much for the nervous system. So if we can't resolve our feelings of fear or not feeling safe with moving, we'll just shut down, which looks like spacing out, just going away from people. And the question for you to be aware of is, Highly sensitives are worried like all human beings, but they're more worried about when you don't feel safe, what do you do? Do you get hyperactive or moving around or do you just go away and shut down and kind of go into your room and try to stay quiet to get away from the energy? These are something highly sensitives do. Sometimes they speed up, sometimes they go away and wanna isolate to stay away from being overwhelmed. I wanna tell you that there's three languages in the brain and you can always listen to this, this recording back tonight after it's over because there's a lot of information I know, but you can pick and choose what really speaks to you to try at home. But the brainstem talks through physical sensations to us, like a tight stomach or a racing heart or goosebumps or a, the chills when you get them or pressure on the chest. That's the brainstem talking, which is again, right at the base of your hairline of your, if you put your hand where your hairline starts, that's your brainstem survival center. Remember the limbic system is our emotional center. It talks us through emotions, happiness and sadness, anger and hurt, love and fear. Those are the six primary emotions and also through memories. Having a flat a memory is the limbic system talking to us. And finally, the frontal cortex or to cortex talks through images, thoughts, and words. So sensations, emotions, and memories, and images, thoughts, and words. 
three languages of the brain. So during the day, if this was the body of a, a 10 year old or a 14 year old, their brainstem is gonna be dumping sensations into the body. Like they're gonna get butterflies in their stomach before a test. And the limbic system is gonna be dropping the emotions like fear or maybe anger or maybe happiness into their body. And eventually they're gonna build up. Unless you do something to help get rid of some of those emotions or move them along. And ideally you can imagine three holes in the bottom or some holes in the bottom of this container where if you moved or did calming activities, you could dissipate the sensations and emotions because when they build up and overflow, that's when a child's gonna act out or have a meltdown or just shut down and lay down on the floor. Or if they're a teenager, go away into the room. Their nervous system just gets overwhelmed. It's like it's too much and they shut down. So I just want to show you this science so that the vagus nerve is our calming nerve. And anytime you do a common activity with your child, you're going to be strengthening, believe it or not, or helping develop habits to tap into the vagus nerve, our calming nerve. It runs from the brainstem at the base of the neck, down through the lungs and heart down through the liver it connects to, the spleen, um, and down to the stomach. So there's connection between the stomach and the brainstem. And that's why calming activities are so important to help calm the body because a lot of the information in the body goes up to the brain and tells the brain how the body is doing, whether it's calm or stressed. Let's go back over one of these calming techniques right now. Now we're talking about the vagus nerve and trying to help your highly sensitive child find ways to calm, here's another way you can help them. So we're gonna put one hand on our chest and one hand on our belly, and we're gonna breathe deeply in through your nose. You're gonna breathe in and pull in oxygen. And if you pull in oxygen for three or four seconds, then you wanna, or for three seconds, then you wanna exhale for six seconds. If you inhale for four seconds of oxygen, then you're gonna exhale out of your mouth for eight seconds. So just Exhale twice as long as you inhale. And again, you're bringing in good oxygen, which is great for the brain and body, and this blowing out carbon dioxide, which is a waste gas. Breath is so important for calming the nervous system. And when you, there's all styles of breathing, different types of breathing you can learn online. But when you breathe in through your nose and then breathe out very slowly for twice as long as you inhale, it slows down the brain and nervous system and creates a feeling of calm. So let's just, let's give this a try right now. Just take a couple breaths in. You're gonna breathe in through your nose for three to four to five seconds and then breathe out for twice as long. Exhale through your mouth really slowly. So it looks like this. I'm going to try one more. I realized I wasn't modeling very good. I got into my head, but the exhale ideally is longer like this. Let's go ahead and just take a couple of deep breaths right now. The brain and nervous system, highly sensitive youth have faster reflexes, which can come in handy if you're playing sports like I did. More affected, they're more affected by pain and medications and stimulants, and that's something doctors don't always know. The more react, they have more reactive immune systems and more allergies often because they're so, they have a, a revved up nervous system that's kind of working hard. Reactions to being overstimulated, how do they respond, highly sensitive youth? They, they complain a lot, Play, plays alone, watches quietly from the sidelines, stays in one spot outside or in one room. So they often can be sort of isolating because they're scared of being hurt or overwhelmed. They can have tantrums or rages more often, especially as toddlers and young kid. Sometimes they try to be perfectly obedient because correcting them, they, they feel things so intensely. So any form of correction just makes them feel really, it's hard on them. 
doesn't mean you're, you're not going to correct them. That's not the moral of the story. Sometimes they stay on a computer or read all day. They, they isolate and avoid. Sometimes they're bouncing off the walls if they have too much energy. Sometimes they get stomach aches or headaches. And sometimes they overcompensate for what seems a flaw. They strive to be a star or perfect, which is exhausting because again, they just don't want to deal with people being upset at them or criticism. But that's part of what they're going to have to learn to deal with. What are the challenges to being a highly sensitive child? Those are some of the reactions you see. Now let's just be more specific. Well, as we talked about, the challenges can also be opportunities. So I'm going to put the word the challenges or opportunities because every challenge is an opportunity with the right mindset. They're easily overwhelmed. They're easily upset. They have meltdowns. They're shy when overwhelmed. They feel stronger emotions, more intense joy and fear and sadness and hurt and anger. They're very attuned to other, others' feelings and what's going on inside them. They, they feel different a lot. They feel different. They're isolated. They're alone. They're very attuned to you. They will want to take care of your needs or pain. It's encouraging for you to do your personal growth work because you don't want, they're so tuned into your own upset feelings inside that they'll want to take care of you or take a, help you, but that's not their job as a child. Another challenge for them is gut health. Because of the vagus nerve connecting to the gut from the brainstem, they often get anxious and all that anxiety affects their gut and digestion, and that can affect their mood. There's more and more research looking at the relationship between our brain and our skull and our brain and our intestines because they talk to each other and they affect each other. The gut brain, the gut produces 50% of our dopamine. That's our, our reward drug or neurotransmitter that helps us feel the pleasure of reward. 90% of the serotonin is produced in the gut. That's what antidepressants work on. That's our feel-good drug, help lifts our mood. And then 70% of our immune systems in our gut. So that's why highly sensitive often have immune issues and have issues with serotonin or dopamine because the gut is so stressed and tied up that it can't function properly. And that affects the chemicals that the brain needs to feel good. How can you support your highly sensitive child? This is what's most important. First of all, when we feel understood, really understood, it soothes our fears and our pain and calms our nervous systems. Ultimately, it strengthens us and empowers us. So just under help trying to understand the, your highly sensitive child and what's going on in their bodies without judging them or giving them advice, but really understanding that can have a big effect on them and on any human being for that matter. We all wanna be understood for what we're going through. And just this type of connection, not where you're trying to fix them and take away their emotion, which is hard, because if they're kids who feel deeply, it's gonna be, they're gonna invite you to feel deeply with them. That's what they need is learning how to watch you feel deeply and manage your own anger or fear or hurt or sadness by doing different healthy things like breathing or walking or talking. And when we can connect without trying to change someone or give them advice and just breathe with them and acknowledge what they're feeling and their sadness and normalize it, that it's okay and it's normal, this all helps them relax into feeling what they're feeling and to learn how to feel these feelings in relationship. Because when they can feel the, any strong emotion and not be, overwhelmed by it and learn how to calm themselves. That's a lifelong gift. Here's a young gymnast going to a gymnastics meet and she talks about her fear. And instead of helping her go into her fear and talk about it more and find a way to deal with it, the parents just try to get it to go away. The dad says, well, you'll hear what he says. Exciting day. During the two-hour drive to the competition, Ashley's ankle begins to swell. This is enough, kiddo. Ashley, what do a uh, good gymnast do? Suck it up. Suck it up, that's right. Yeah, but not too much. Honey, your ankle... 
So I don't know if you saw that clip, but she expressed fear. And that was an invitation for their parents to use that as a coaching moment and say, hey, what are you scared about? And I wonder if there's something we could do to help you calm yourself right now. The mom said, oh, you don't need to be scared. And the dad said, what do good gymnasts do? Tough it up. This idea of pushing down the fear, but how is she going to learn how to deal with her fear if her parents don't help her or her coaches don't help her? How do you support a highly sensitive youth or an SHSY? Discuss being highly sensitive what it means, the gifts, the challenges, and how to self-care. They need to know who they are, that there's nothing wrong with them. There's nothing weird about them. It's a form of intelligence. They have a certain gift, and but it's challenging to have this gift. And this is what we're going to have to do. They have to learn about this. And there are books out there. Or I can be of support, too. And there's other people that have specialties in highly sensitive children and, and teenagers. Get support for yourself and learning about your fears and pains and manage them so they don't so you don't project them on your child. Allows a child to be a child. Often parents get watch your child feel strong emotions and it sort of triggers them and they start feeling strong emotions, but because they didn't get support when they were growing up with feeling emotions of common themselves, they don't know what to do. And so they start trying to tell their child what to do and squelch the emotion. That's why getting support in a support group or from a therapist or whatever it takes to a book, online training, to get support and learning how to feel what's your emotions and calm them separate from your child is really important. Get support for yourself so you can grow from your child's challenges because anything your child's going through that's difficult can be a blessing for you. It can help you grow in some positive way. You can get support from, again, an outside source to empower your highly sensitive child, to find out ideas to support them. We all need coaching. And all therapy is, is coaching, you know, and, and we get coaching in all areas of life. And mental health is no different. We all need support. The big part is, again, educate yourself about this topic. And there are books out there and people who do trainings like myself. Talk to their teachers and brainstorm ways to support the child. Sometimes teachers won't know about highly sensitive youth and they might incorrectly try to manage that child in the classroom and tell you they're too shy or they're too sensitive or they need to toughen up, but that's not the mindset. It's more, I'd love to look at ways that that teacher and you can work together to help that child calm themselves in the midst of the classroom. They can be a good leader in a classroom, a highly sensitive child. They can be a barometer of what's being felt in a classroom so teachers can help other students learn how to calm themselves. They're sort of like the canary in the coal mine. Encourage your child, don't push them to do scary things. I know you think that's gonna help them get stronger, but they have to do it where they don't just get thrown into the water. That can just re-traumatize a child, especially if they're really highly sensitive. When they seem to want to do something, encourage them and remind them of past successes. So you got to keep reminding highly sensitives of how they already did something that was scary and how it was turned out positive. Your brains will forget that. Celebrate their successes. When they do do something scary, acknowledge that. And then I'm going to share an idea for a resiliency journal, which is a really powerful way to help highly sensitive see the, the strength they have inside. Then emotion coaching. All that means is really work with your child and learning how to identify their emotions and calm themselves. And the same with you. You can work with them. Learn to manage your, your own emotions so you can tune attune to emotion to be a supportive container. If you don't can't manage your own emotions and feel your emotions and calm yourself. It's going to be hard, but just be truthful if you can't that, Hey, I'm not good at this. I'm going to be working with you on this and we'll learn together. You know, highly sensitive need to see anger as a good emotion because anger can be a good emotion when it's well expressed and well used. It's often used to hurt people, but anger can inspire us to stand up for ourselves, to speak our truth and to take action so highly sensitive need to honor their anger and learn to and help your child express it in a healthy way or healthy ways. 
praise efforts, not global comments. Don't say to your child, always be specific, like that. I really appreciate how you cleaned the room today. Instead of saying, you're so kind, you cleaned the room. Because when you make global statements, you're, you're the best child in the world. You're so kind. You're always so loving. But that scares kids. They're never perfect. And it's better to praise their effort than to make a global character statement about them. Plan ahead for success and anticipate overwhelm. If you go into a, a party with a lot of people and your child gets overwhelmed, you might talk to them ahead of what they can do if they're overwhelmed. Maybe they can go outside and take a walk with you. Maybe there's a room they can go to just to be quiet. But you want to plan ahead, especially if you're not going to be there, and rehearse it. Let your child know about upcoming transitions and give them time to get used to that they're going to make a big change so that it doesn't overwhelm their nervous system. Role play. Discuss self-care options and the challenges of being with people are an intense gathering. So if you're going to an intense gathering or they're a teenager going to a friend's house and they get overwhelmed, you might talk to them and role play what they can do if they're overwhelmed. And maybe talk to the parents where they're going. So the parent, and maybe even to this child, the friends of your child, so they know that your child's highly sensitive and not that they have to treat them in some um, different way, but just be aware that they might need to do some calming activities or take a walk around the block or do something to help them regulate their nervous system. Don't allow a child to be rude they can be overwhelmed and still be polite and take care of themselves. Read books with them and talk about the characters and how they're dealing with their emotions because that way they can start seeing that there's a lot of kids out there who have trouble dealing with their emotions and they show up in novels a lot. Paying attention to your own beliefs and attitudes. You want to support your child, not overprotect them because you, you just want them to learn who they are and how to take care of themselves in this overwhelming world. You don't want to change them because who they are is a gift and you don't want to overprotect them, you know, and that's why it's not an easy dance. I know it's just want to acknowledge it's not easy, but it's possible. And the last four points, practice calming techniques and find your favorite one to do during the day and with your child. Set up a calming ritual at the end of the day, some breathing exercise or some massage that you do on their shoulders or something to help them calm themselves. Have fun. Create joyful, nourishing activities where you're not using technology, but just playing outside or connecting to each other. See your child as strong, powerful, and capable, which they are. And find, yep, I already said that one. That's repetitious. Sometimes highly sensitives can be teased by other kids because they're, they're misunderstood for who they are and what they need. And that's why educating their friends can be helpful. And you might contact the parent and just say, hey, I just want to share a little bit about what we learned about our child. This is one of his strengths or her strengths, but this can be challenging for them. And I just need your help with supporting them if you don't mind. And you might even talk to their friends all at once and just share, because the more you can normalize this, the more you take the shame out of it and the potential for teasing. Kids tease a lot because they're, they, they're scared of kids who feel deeply or look different and they don't know what to do with their uncomfortable feelings, so they tease. But once they understand, they can be empathetic. Connection is so important for highly sensitives to not only get from those the downstairs brain to the upstairs brain and calm themselves, but just to feel connected to people because that's how we self-regulate our emotions and learn to soothe ourselves. And for them to find friends who understand them is so important. So they're not isolated. They, they can hang out with kids who aren't highly sensitive and who might be are more energetic, but somehow they can support each other because we need balance in our life and highly sensitive can balance off kids who have a different energy. These are words that highly sensitive here and be careful of saying these. I know parents don't mean to hurt their kids and they're just sometimes sharing what their parents taught them, but these are hurtful comments. I heard this often, you're too sensitive, you're too much. You need to toughen up. And these are things other kids have heard, not just me. You need to relax, grow up, act like a big kid. You're weak. Shake it off. It's not that big a deal. What's wrong with you? Don't take it so seriously. 
lighten up. You're a baby. You're a crybaby. You have to be mentally stronger. You know, they, my dad, again, um, this is him with me as a baby and my mom. And he died when I was 13 without saying goodbye. And it was devastating. And it gave me this idea I share with parents and teachers of creating a resiliency journal or an SEL journal, social emotional learning journal. And it's my most powerful parenting idea. Get a notebook for each child. And each, each night, write one or two sentences at night in the notebook on your bedstand or whatever. Something, if something happened that day, and look for things that area of SEL, which stands for social emotion learning, something they displayed. If they were empathetic or they did a random act of kindness, or they faced a fear, or they calmed themselves when feeling intense emotion, or they worked out a conflict, or they persevered when something is difficult, they were being honest with you. They befriended a child who was lonely. They shared feelings with you. They were a team player. And you write that one sentence, not with a bunch of description, just said you, you didn't, you didn't, you cheered on your teammates when you didn't get to play today. You helped that child who was sitting all alone at lunch. Whatever happened, or you know, to affirm, or, or you worked out that conflict with your brother without um, in a peaceful way, in a in a win-win way whatever it is, one sentence, and then give them the notebooks to your children on their birthday. And if you want to, one year record your voice, reading them all out loud. So now they have a, a journal and your voice that can last a lifetime, that whenever they're discouraged, they can go back and read all the goodness that you saw, all the ways that their sensitivity helped other people or helped themselves, and the gift it was to the world and to them. It can be a great gift. And I would give a lot of money if I had one for my dad. Let's do one more calming technique of the six. The body pressure is one I love. These thunder shirts are made for dogs and they put gentle pressure on dogs' body and help anxious dogs deal with their anxiety. Pressure is like being holding a baby. When we hold a baby gently but firmly, it calms their nervous system and soothes them. Weighted blankets can do that for children. This hug sleep can do the same for adults. You wear it and it creates gentle pressure that calms you and makes you feel safe, but it's using the concept of pressure and calming the nervous system. You can put pressure on your, your face and your arms during the day to calm yourself. I like that doing this a lot. And then you can just apply gentle pressure with pillows on a child's body to just, again, slow their nervous system and help them calm. It's a handy calming technique. Movement is really important and connecting one side of the body like the left elbow to right knee is really good to connect the different brain hemispheres, but movement can be good in dealing with high sensitivity. Juggling can be great for, again, moving the body and moving energy and helping highly sensitive calm. Nature is one of the most important ways to calm because there's something very calming and soothing about being out in nature. There's something called EFT or emotional freedom technique. I encourage you to look it up because it's, it uses acupressure or acupuncture, the different points on your body that can help you calm your nervous system. And some forms of EFT use some words to say, and it's a sequence of quick tapping techniques with some words that very slows the nervous system and can be very helpful for highly sensitive youth. Biofeedback, you can buy th things for the computer that train your child to watch certain things and calm their nervous system. They watch their, their heart rhythms, they do different things and they learn to use their brains to calm the nervous system. They, you can also go see a therapist trained in biofeedback, it's a handy tool. Anything to do with music and you put on music and dance or move in the house and try to identify what emotions you're feeling can be a good way for kids to learn to feel emotions and move the energy and self-regulate. It's not easy being a parent and trying to connect with a teenage daughter or any child and, and being able to connect from an emotional point of view, which is what they're craving. There's a time for advice and a time for coaching them on maybe decisions, but there's a time just to connect to emotions and feel what they feel and acknowledge it and empathize. Because 
kids need connection emotionally when they're feeling emotionally distraught. When you're being intellectual and they're being in their emotions, it can feel like you're not getting me, you're not understanding me. Just notice these kids and how you connect with these kids. Obviously, this one's feeling fear, anger. How do you connect with that emotion? Joy is an easier one to connect with. Sadness, maybe sadness or hurt here. Unfortunately, when kids are overwhelmed and highly sensitive are overwhelmed with emotions or sensations, they often turn to screens now, which is, is okay, but they're not connecting face to face, which is different and not as good for the brain. And the more and more kids tune out the world and get caught in their own world, they're isolating in a way that's not always healthy. And now they're playing video games for, you know, can sit all day and do it. And there's an addictive quality to that. And again, they're needing more time, I believe, physically being outside, moving and connecting with other friends and adults. But unfortunately, when they have time for adults, often adults, you know, tune in their own phones. And even though there's some physical connection here, there's no emotional connection per se, maybe the warmth of body. One of my biggest concerns is what happens online these days, especially for highly sensitive, because so much is kids bully each other that they don't know what to do with their emotions. And they often will tease or put down kids through social media. And there's no accountability, you know, back before technology, we had to face someone to talk to them and we had to feel our emotions and still talk and try to resolve conflicts. Now you just share something with no accountability and it can really hurt kids who feel deeply. So I would limit time on a computer really or at iPhones and you can set different devices for that or have an hour each day where you don't have any social media or phones. Um, but you have to coach and support your child on this because otherwise they're gonna isolate. If you're not available to connect and there's not meaningful motivation or connection, they will withdraw. And that, this is my concern with mental health. I have this feeling that a lot of highly sensitive youths take their life if there's no good support in their life or they don't have the tools. And I don't have research to show it. It's just my gut feeling from experience that many kids who feel deeply get overwhelmed and they isolate. And then from there, it gets very dark and they don't know a way out. So this is extremely important. And before the end of the year, I'll be talking about trauma and I'll be talking about suicide prevention, which ties into highly sensitive. What we all need, but highly sensitive needs especially is human connection, eye to eye connection. And we need in this day and age of fast paced technology to slow down and connect once in a while, face to face, whether it's playing a game or around the dinner table or something. It's also trying to help children and the highly sensitive see not to be denying their sadness or their fear, or their anger or hurt, because you want them to help them learn how to feel and calm themselves. But you can feel deep emotions and still have hope. And hope is looking for the for the for what good in the world there is. And as Fred Rogers said, when I was a boy and I would see scary things in the news, my mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping. And that's true in the midst of anything that's sad, you, even in the Ukraine war, which is going on right now, you can look at the people like in Poland who are welcoming in helping the Ukraine people. And that can help a highly sensitive child who's feeling very distraught about human events to help them see all the good people helping other people to balance off that what the news is saying. You can start a gratitude journal in your, in your house where you focus on the simple things to be grateful. And that can help a highly sensitive you know, deal with um, some of the deep, uncomfortable feelings or a family journal that you all write in during the day. The other thing I just want to mention is service. One of the best ways to help young people feel empowered and they can make a difference and especially highly sensitive because they're empathetic people that want to help other people to put that energy to work at school, at home, on teams, to volunteer and help other people in some way. And you can help other people no matter how challenged you are. There's always somebody who's more challenged than you. And to get a group together of friends and do something to help other people helps highly sensitive feel like they have power to make a difference. So they don't just fixate on the negative. 
I'm not going to show this today, but you can look it up online because I think we're running a little overtime right now. And I want to wrap up for the day. I think I have gone a little long and I apologize for anyone who's staying on, but this is a really important topic. And I wanted to try to give you all the tools I could tonight so you can go off and it, you know support your child or yourself. But there's a video on uh, TV. If you look at We Dine Together, and it's this beautiful story of a Florida school where kids at lunchtime go around helping kids who have no friends and they talk to them and they invite them to eat with them. And it's, it's really, I think, I imagine this group is, has a, highly, a lot of highly sensitive kids who are formed this club that's the prime goal is not have everyone, does not allow any child or teenager at that high school to, to eat alone. And it's a beautiful way to take the empathy and sensitivity of students and tap into connecting people together in a school, which is ultimately what we all want is more connection. And we want to be ourselves and be different, but connected to each other. And that's how the world is best when we're working that way. You know, teaching your child about the brain can help ease their shame about what's going on in their body and see it as normal function. They just need more skills and brain development. And again, knowing about the three languages of the brain, and the more you can incorporate sensations and emotions and memories and, and images or words and thoughts into different things, it's going to be empowering. When you're reading out loud with your child, pause and just notice what the brainstem is saying. What are the physical sensations and what are you feeling emotionally? Happy or sad, angry or hurt, love or fear. I'm going to skip over this story because we're running out of time. But when you're playing a video game, you can allow your child, you know, child, you're going to let them play some games, of course, you just want to create limits on how long. But when you if you're playing with them, you could use the three brain languages and make a deal that you're going to pause once in a while and you're going to try to feel what you're feeling in your body, sensation wise emotions and do a, a deep breathing ex exercise or shake your hands or rub your hands together or your arms to regulate while your child's playing a video game. Because if you can stay connected and reflect out loud, it's gonna help him or her learn to reflect and self-regulate while they're playing a video game instead of just spacing out, which is not healthy for long periods. And again, if you're playing a video game, stop and pause and self-reflect on the three languages of the brain and verbalize it out loud and ask your child to reflect too. And if they're saying, I don't wanna do that, say, hey, this is my deal. We're going to practice this once in a while while we're playing a video game. It can be a win-win. And this is how it might sound if you're just speak, you can speak this out loud in the car or while you're doing breakfast. You could say, we only have 10 minutes before school starts. I notice my heart's racing. That's your body sensations or your brain stem talking. And I'm feeling scared. That's your limbic system or emotional center. And I'm going to take some deep breaths. That's your court frontal cortex and your self-care. To do that out loud in the car once in a while and invite your child to reflect out loud. And if they're asking why you're doing that, say you're trying to work on your mental health and your social emotional intelligence, get stronger and help them. Again, this is a quick little 10 second activity. And again, anytime you can stop and play with your child on the ground and get down on their level and not try to analyze them or advise, but just feel what you're feeling in your body and acknowledge what you're feeling and what they might be feeling. And because they're going to set you up to feel what they're feeling, both sensation wise and emotionally. And the more you can tap into what you're feeling and try to verbalize it, like, I'm feeling like, wow, you're racing that car right now. And I'm noticing my stomach's a little tight and I'm feeling a little scared because it's going so fast. I'm going to take a deep breath. And then you go back and he or she might be doing something different, but connect emotionally with your child. The last thing I want to say really is pediatricians obviously care a lot about kids and youth and teenagers, but they aren't always trained in developmental trauma and developmental tra or trauma itself. They know physical trauma, but not emotional trauma. And they also don't know always much about highly sensitive youth. So when a teenager or a young person comes in with anxiety or fear or sadness, they often medicate right away. And there is a time and place for medications. There is. They can be very helpful in crisis. But it's also important that with that, to add in therapy 
or to add in support for a parent or working on skills to develop your child's brain and nervous system. So eventually they might not have to take that, but I think pediatricians feel helpless and they, they really care and they don't always know how to help kids socially and emotionally. That's not what they're trained in. And their quick remedy is to give a drug or a pharmaceutical to, to medicate kids. And again, uh, it might be appropriate, but you also might want to get knowledgeable about the brain and nervous system. So when you go in, you can bring up these topics and create a holistic approach to helping your child. There are books out there, and this one's by Elaine Aron, who's really a pioneer in this area, many other books. Um, but you also, this is obviously, as you can hear from me, a very personal and important topic. And so if I could be a support to you or your child in this area, please don't hesitate, hesitate to contact me. You can find me at teachingheartinstitute.com or email me at tom at teachingheartinstitute.com. I hope this has been helpful. I'm sorry I went a little longer and I thank you for staying with it. And, and again, I wish you all the best and I hope that you really learn as much as you can about highly sensitive children. And if you're highly sensitive, you learn about yourself and it can help both you and your child. Take care, be well, and have a good night. See you, bye. Take care, everyone. Uh, it's been great. And if you're interested, next month we'll be talking about trauma. And the following month in May, we'll be talking about suicide prevention. So I hope to see you at those presentations. Good night.